You're watching Three Hand Media Watch Talk, where we cover everything from dive watches to pilots, anything watch related. So we hope you enjoy. This is Iconic Ivan, and I usually have on some great guests. So tune in every Thursday around 2 p.m. Eastern Time for some great watch talk with some great people. I hope you enjoy. Brought to you by Wrist Check Monthly and Slots of Watches. Good evening, everyone. So, yeah, usually have on great guests. Today is no different. Uh, I got Mr. Aaron Coates from over at Buzel, and they're one of the greatest watch brands, especially when you look at the independent micro space. So I'm super happy to have him on. Just a couple of uh, little announcements to make um, as far as Iconic goes. We're just kind of waiting on shipment. Um, there's custom issues. There's, you know, all the stuff that comes with, with shipping. So hopefully we'll have our first batch real soon. I can do a quality control check and get out the first batch. Um, next announcement real quick. Um, this will be the last podcast that I do live I'm gonna go back to the um the interview format and and start doing um recorded shows that way you know I think that it puts on a better show for you guys I can still uh answer questions in the in the comment section and things like that so um also one of the reasons that I'm gonna be doing that is uh, Brad and Brian, they're going another direction and they're going to be doing their own thing on their own channel. And I am actually going to be joining, uh, watch with us media. So you'll be able to find the replay of this, the edited version over there on, uh, watch with us media. So that's pretty much all I got for today, except for our awesome guest. Let's go ahead and bring him on and uh, let him introduce himself. Mr. Aaron, how's it going, man? Mate, very well. Very happy to be here. Um, good to have someone to talk to other than my family after the <laughs> three months of being stuck in the same house with them. As much as I love them, it's good to talk to someone else. Absolutely, man. The quarantine has been brutal. Um, I actually felt a little bit lucky that I got to spend some time in the hospital and see different nurses every day. <laughs> so, you know, it is what it is. Um, we're having fun, though. Uh, so uh, tell me a little bit about yourself. How did you end up getting into the watch world? Um, I got into the watch world kind of sideways actually i was <laughs> moving to la from sydney and uh, a friend of mine who was one of the original investors in bossell said um aaron and beck my wife uh are moving to the states and you should probably meet them christo and see you know if there's anything you guys could do not just a conversation and then that led to us um taking on the distrib distribution in the u.s and within that distribution, we, we started to grow Bossell early in mm -hmm. like maybe that's about five years ago. But then my wife and I started another business um, in the beauty space and that blew up to you know, 4,000 retail stores and about over 100, over 100 uh, countries online. And wow. that, was, that was in the space of about 18 months. And I said to Christo, look, we're – I'm overwhelmed here, like great, <laughs> great problem to have. And um, so we, Christo understood entirely and he said, look, don't worry about it for now. You just do what you got to do. And then um, when we sold that company, Christo and the board approached me. They'd just gone through a crowdfunding or an equity crowdfunding round in October 2018. Yep. And then they part of that crowdfunding was that they needed to have a, a new CEO and a new constitution, and Christo had to, you know, step back as a, you know, the founder had to step back in, in, into a more operations role. Um, so they approached me to implement some of the same global growth strategies we did in the beauty space. Obviously, it's a much higher product, uh, different industry, but, you know, people buy for the same reasons, and, you know, it's, you know, business models are the same. 
So, yeah, products are products. Yeah. At the end of the day. Yeah. Um, it's funny because I actually I actually did a an interview with Christo right around that time. And you have no idea he was so excited to have you back. <laughs> that was <laughs> that was one of the things that he kept boasting about is oh, we got Aaron, we got Aaron back and he's he's taking care of everything over in the US and blah blah blah. And I tell you, he went on and on about having you back working with him. Uh, that's that's good to know. He never told me that, but no, he's always <laughs> he's always very full of praise and his passion is like nothing I've ever seen before. Right. I agree with you. And, you know, just his lifestyle, you know, uh, getting up every morning and swimming in the ocean and just everything that he does just it's different than normal people. You know, you, you, you got normal people that sit on the couch and watch family guy or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? But Christo is, is just built from a different cloth. Matt, I've never met anyone as passionate as him. And, you know, starting a brand is tough. And he's so passionate for, like, for business. He's so passionate for watches and designing watches. And he's so passionate for people. So mm -hmm. to do some of the things he's been able to do, Bossell was the first brand to ever partner with the Sydney Opera House. They'd never collaborated on anything before. And, and through Christo's passion, he, he enabled that to happen. Um, you know, for a, a, a micro brand at that time is, is incredible. Absolutely. Um, so tell us about that collaboration. Like, what did they do exactly and why was the collaboration uh, put in place? Look, it, it's, you know, well, it all started with when Christo first moved to Australia. Um, he met his wife, who was an Australian dancer in, in Geneva. And then they fell in love and moved back to Australia. And when he, mm. he got to Australia, he fell in love all over again. He said, this mm. is the best lifestyle. Um, I can't believe that there is a place like this. And he, he realized there were no premium watch brands. There were a few watch brands, but not, not at the yeah. premium level. So two things that his watch brand needed. One, it needed to be Swiss made. And two, it had to be something uniquely Australian. And because he's, you know, he's a little bit out there guy, Mm -hmm. And he loves to design stuff. And he ended up coming up with the hollow crown concept. And the hollow crown, he was in the early days putting some red earth from the centre of Australia or some yeah. one of the sand from one of our beaches on display. So that allowed him or opened up the brand to bespoke watches with corporates. So when they approached the, the Sydney Opera House, they said, look, we, I can design a watch for you. And that watch was designed specifically around the opening of the Sydney Opera House. Yes. So all of the sales on the, on the dial align to, to show the Opera House at 2.45 p.m. every day, which is wow. it only shows the Opera House once per day, and that's at the time when the Queen Elizabeth opened, cut the, the cord and opened, officially opened the Opera House. Wow, um, that's crazy. I didn't know that. Yeah, so all of Christo's watches, he loves them to tell a story. You know, mm -hmm. it needs, every, every design aspect needs to mean something. Mm -hmm. So with that hollow crown... They were, he was then able to approach the opera house and say, what if we were to take, I was to design a watch for you and we were to take one of the tiles off the, off the roof that's been sitting there for forever since the, since the opera house was first launched. Um, and we, we grind up and we put a little piece into this watch and, you know, when you're selling it in your opera house store, you can be sending a piece of the opera house all around the world and they thought it was an amazing idea. Um, Absolutely. To promote the opera house and to promote an Australian brand or an emerging Australian brand. And um, just a, a, an amazing fit. And, you know, the world knows the Op Sydney Opera House. It's one of the most iconic buildings. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, when people believe in, in something like the Opera House, they, ne they then believe in Bossell because it's, you know, if the Opera House has already pre-vetted us and they've partnered with us, then, you know, we, we're solid. Absolutely. It's like... Uh... Uh, guilty by association, but yeah, kind of yeah. the reverse way. <laughs> but yeah. one of the great things about the Hollow Crown is, you know, it's not just red earth and beach sand and uh, crushed tile that you could put in there. Um, Crystal was telling me about a gentleman that came to him and he wanted his father's ashes yeah. put in the crown. And I thought that was just amazing. You know, what a tribute 
and an honor for you guys mm -hmm. to have somebody come to you with that. I mean, that's got to feel and pretty amazing. The, the note that that guy wrote to us, thanking us for having such a special keepsake um, on his wrist that he can carry with him everywhere he goes. It, you know, it was, it was amazing. It, it felt in the beginning, I was kind of like, Oh, you know, is this the right thing to do or not or yeah. whatever. But you know, then the more we thought about it, it's something special that we could afford to do for someone that's out of the ordinary, you know, why not go above and beyond to, to help people. Absolutely. Absolutely. Look, that, that's one of the things, you know, for, for me, I do a lot of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and that's constant learning and constant improving. And one thing for Christo and I, we're always trying to find ways that we can do better. You know, and Christo is constantly trying to improve the quality of the watches, whether it's the packaging, whether it's the nano ceramic, which is 30% stronger than Sapphire Crystal. It doesn't matter what it is. It's, it's you know, just getting better. He was telling me the last time that uh, I spoke with him that he was working on something over in Japan, I think it was, that... Uh, uh, was going to be harder than the sapphire crystal. So that's it. That's the nano it. Ceramic. Yeah. If I, I'll send you some videos after this, after the podcast. And we, if they, where they drop a, a ball bearing on the center of the, the glass and wow. sapphire crystal drops at say 100, this drops at 130. So it's, wow. it's uh, 130 as opposed to 100. So it's, it's a massive difference. And, you know, it, Australians, we consider ourselves, outdoor rugged adventurous like let's have a go yeah. um we consider <laughs> ourselves kind of strong so you know it needs to be australian strength and swiss precision that's the way we look at it anyway. <laughs> so the brazilian jiu-jitsu let's get into that a little bit is that something that you've been doing kind of like lifelong because if you go look at your facebook it looks like you've been doing it for a very long time like i don't want to get in the ring with you <laughs> um i've been doing it for about 15 years um, 15 years so i got into it kind of late i'm i'm a, what am i now i'm just about to i'm about to turn 49 um so i started i come from a, a beach in sydney called maruba beach and you know it's million dollar homes next to a hundred dollar a week housing commission so it's an interesting mm -hmm. mix of like right on the beach you know so um and everyone there was getting into jujitsu and they started saying come on come down let's Try it with me, try it with me. I thought, no way. You guys just mm. want to beat, beat me up. I'm not stupid. <laughs> um, so I resisted it for a few years and then I finally went and did a class and it was like, whoa, hang on, this is quite fun. It's like I'm fighting, with, wrestling with my brother in the, in the living room, but I'm not going to get in any trouble. And, <laughs> yeah. And it was quite respectful and gentle and, and things. And then three months later, I did my first tournament and I had absolutely no idea what I was doing. None. <laughs> I just knew I was petrified from the minute I hit register in the tournament. I was petrified and I, sure. I got out there and I couldn't, I couldn't see straight. I couldn't think. <laughs> I couldn't do anything. And I was just hanging onto this guy for my life and he was <laughs> hanging onto me and neither of us knew what to do. And then um, he did it, something illegal accidentally and then I got a, he got a penalty, so I won. And <laughs> like, I, how I did this win. happen? Yeah. <laughs> I didn't want to. I didn't want to win because that meant I had to go back out and do it again in about ten minutes in the final. <laughs> um, and I didn't. I didn't want to go through that hell again. And then look, I, I, I drove home from that event thinking you can't have things in your life that scare you that much. Yeah, I'm going to do more of that. And then I started to do more of that. And and you know the the biggest fight in jujitsu is the fight with yourself when you when you're competing, or in anything. It's problem solving under pressure. Yeah. So, I I think that goes across everything in life. You Absolutely. Know? If, if you're scared of something, then you got to drive through that. Otherwise, it, you will get defeated. If you let that defeat you, you're going to let something else defeat you. 100%. And that was the thing that I loved. You know, I, I had a breakdown in my early 20s and um, with a lot of anxiety and a lot of panic attacks and, and all sorts of things that I, I, I overcame through that mentality of having to face some things and, you know, the more we shy away from things, the bigger the fear grows. But yeah. once, you, once you go through it, I mean, the, the other fear lies, well, they say recovery lies on the other side of fear and you have to go through it. There's no, there's no other there's way. There's no going around it. it no. Absolutely. I'm actually, because of being in the hospital and dealing with what I've had to deal with here recently, um, I'm actually dealing with a lot of that anxiety and stuff like that and using some of those techniques to, to try to get through it. it it's tough, 
but it has to be done. There, there's no yeah. getting around it. Otherwise, I'll be stuck here at the house and not be able to go anywhere. And, you know, you can't rely on medications and stuff like that because nope. then that's a whole other problem. Yeah. I'm going to, when this podcast is over, I'm going to send you a, a podcast I did on mental health and my journey and um, all about anxiety and overcoming it and, and the leverage that we have that we don't know when, when we believe in ourselves. Yeah. What's funny, I don't know if this is the same way for you or not, but for me, I end up, it's kind of in waves. Like I'll, I'll go years without having an issue at all. And then I'll go through several months where like I freak out every day. And it, 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 it's, it's strange because when you're during, when you're in those times where you're freaking out every day, you forget what it's like to be able to have those normal days. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it's like Absolutely. you want to get back to that, but you don't even remember it. Mm. And then you don't know how. And then you think, you know, I've got to go through this to get to that. I'd rather stay here, you know, and then you get in the <laughs> habit of shying away. And then, then what, what I find happens is you find little ways of coping which are kind of avoidance sometimes. Then you get in yeah. the habit of avoiding things. And then before you know it, you're locked in your little space because you avoided everything else. And then your life becomes very small. That's something I didn't know about you that, that we definitely have in common. Um, and, and, and glad that we were speaking yeah. about it now because it, it's so funny how certain things are brought into your life at certain times. Like, you know, um, I've talked to a few people about the issues that I'm going through now, but then it's like, you know, all of a sudden I got one of my almost like mentors in the watch game on my podcast. And he's telling me about the issues that he's had in the past. And it's like, <laughs> wow. No you know what I mean? It. None of us escape it. We can try yeah. to avoid it, but none of us escape it. We got to push through. Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. And, 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 you know, that's one of the, the things of jujitsu is because of that, you're constantly problem solving under pressure and it's mm -hmm. just you and it's a safe environment to get comfortable under pressure. Jujitsu is a safe environment. That's. <laughs> well, you know, they call, you know, they call jujitsu the, the gentle art. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's all leverage and it gives a smaller person. It empowers a smaller person over a bigger person. If, the bigger person doesn't know jujitsu because it's leverage. It's not strength. If yeah. I try to match strength with the bigger person, I'm going to lose. But if I outsmart him and I use leverage, I'm going to win easy. And yeah, that's what absolutely. it's about. It's the strategy of that that gets through life. And it be, you, you develop a learning culture in jujitsu uh, in the last 15 years because you're constantly learning, you're constantly problem solving, and then that translates into all aspects of life. That's incredible. That's I, if I wasn't so big, maybe I would try it. <laughs> you know what? I'm coming if, over. I'm coming over, and you're going to try it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, I, I have always kind of wanted to get into that uh, or, or some sort of uh, martial arts because, you know, I've always been a big guy. So I, I haven't had like issues or anything like that. You know, back when I was going to the bars and stuff like that, you know, some of the, the, little smaller guys that get drunk and want to mess with the big guy at the bar. And so, uh, you know, and normally I just talk myself out of that situation because you don't want to, of course, you know what I'm saying? You don't want to embarrass nobody or, or anything like that. And but the, the better you get as well, the, the more you learn or the more, you know, the less you use. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, I, don't, I don't ever want to get into a fight. Like I've been yeah, doing jiu-jitsu no. for 15 years. I'm a, I'm a black belt and I'm probably more scared to get into a fight now than I was <laughs> prior because I'm, yeah. I'm smarter. Yeah, exactly. You, that's one of the things about jiu-jitsu is that, you know, whenever you're – it looks like you're down and out. You're really not. <laughs> no, you're thinking. You're thinking. And it's, it's like the difference between one centimeter – or 10 millimeters or whatever you, whatever metric you guys use over here is the difference between being choked to sleep and survival. It's this yeah. like this small. It's a game of millimeters and leverage and strategy because if your angle's out by this much, then you don't have the leverage. Change mm -hmm. that angle by a, a, a smidgen and you watch how strong you become. 
Have you uh, have you ever let it get too far to where you have passed out and before you've tapped? Yeah. <laughs> and how is it? Only once for me in in tournaments. In tournaments, I put a lot of people to sleep. Um, yeah. Because they try they try harder and they don't want to tap and they think they get too close. So several people have gone to sleep and then they always wake up and have a laugh. But for me personally, <laughs> I've been to sleep once and weird feeling. I yeah. Mean, it's just like you're waking up from getting out of bed. And you go, but <laughs> like, that, what, I must how the slept. hell did I get here? Yeah, I must have slept <laughs> last night, you know. But it's, it's, yeah, it's a strange feeling. It takes a, a few minutes to get back to, all right, what happened? <laughs> so showing out it's easy to get off topic whenever, yeah, easy, you know. <laughs> so let's get back to the watches a little bit um how many watches do you have in the lineup we have we have four collections now um but we're kind of the terra Australis sits on its own that's a, a design watch where Christo, in his design, designers wearing his designer's hat, wanted to challenge himself. And we also created our own proprietary material with the Center for Nanotechnology at one of the leading universities in Australia. Um, yeah. and, and that just allowed us to, I guess, sh- show the watch industry, hey, we're, we're serious here and we can do some, some amazing things and actually give back to the, to the watch industry because the, that proprietary material that we created, it was about... They said, what problem can we solve? And doing violet watches at the time, which are ceramic casing. The ceramic in the kiln, because there's different temperatures within the kiln, it kiln, it expands and contracts at different different degrees de- depending on different percentages depending on the, the temperature in the kiln. So what they do with the um, with the pressure material is that they insert minute metal particles into the ceramic at extremely high temperatures. And that allows us to control the expansion and contraction rate of just of 1%, no matter where wow. it is in the kiln. So it reduces wastage incredibly. Um, wow. And that was something that Christo, you know, Christo loves the watch industry and he always wants to give back to it. He's, he loves people. He wants to give back to people. He wants to give back to Australia. And he wants to give back to the watch industry. Yeah, I mean, I, I know he started out in Switzerland or or was it France? Um I know that he started out over there, and he was uh, what CEO of uh, Techno Marine was it? He was, just, he was the um, he was the uh, CFO. CFO. So he, yeah, he's the finance guy, and he was he was in his spreadsheets, always in the spreadsheets, dreaming about designing watches. <laughs> so he was balancing the books, but uh, really right. wanted to be but that, out there designing. Big part, that's played a big part in Bossel because you know by by balancing the books. And getting to sign off on, you know, payments and things. He knows where the parts are in every industry, where the best parts are, where the best prices are. So absolutely, that's a great add, concept. He, he can add value to a Swiss watch by keeping, but while still keeping the price at, you know, he he wanted to make Swiss watches more accessible, not to the masses, but at least more accessible to you know to people that deserve a good watch. Yeah, absolutely. Um, what is your latest watch? Our latest watch is this one. Oh, where are we? Well, I haven't seen it with a bracelet yet. Yeah, that's the. Oh, I can't Beautiful. see there. Hang on, I'm yeah. going to hold that one up. That's easier. It's always hard to find the camera. On yeah. These <laughs> it's I mean, always I, a pain in the butt. I don't know why, because it's right in the center. <laughs> um, so, yeah, that's our Vintage 2.0, which is a, uh, a hybrid connected smartwatch. So, tell me how that works. That works. That's connected to the Bossell app on any Android or iPhone uh, device or any smartwatch. And then that, while looking like a dress watch, because one thing that we wanted to do was solve the smartwatch style problem. Because as much as smartwatches, you know, they tell you everything, they do everything, one thing they don't do is look very stylish so yeah <laughs> absolutely they don't look good in a suit or out on a date or on a you know there's a time and place for them but we wanted a, a watch that would keep you connected um but would still you could wear it to the you know to the beach or to the boardroom as we like to say and yeah. myself um so that tracks my activity monitors my sleep it even screens my calls so i think are they your texts coming in really yeah, so, so with, the, with this watch, right, if say you and I, we're talking now and we don't want to be disturbed, but 
we're waiting on an important call for, say, Christo or someone who's going to dial in. We can put our phone on silent and then set this watch, just set the watch to vibrate um, only when Christo calls. So you can go set it really? through your contacts, yeah, and then it will vibrate. I go, hey, Christo's here. So we can be completely present. We can turn our phones to silent and forget about it because we don't need to pay attention to it. The watch has got our back. That's awesome, man. Yeah, it's good. So, so what what's the pricing on something like this uh, is, like this? This is seven fifty Australian, which I think is around five twenty five wow. Aussie. About five twenty five Aussie. That's oh, five twenty five US. Super affordable. Yeah, I thought I thought it was a lot more. Actually, I thought it was up over a thousand. No, we um, Christo, as I just as I said before, like he knows where to add value and how to add value. Um, yeah. without, without negating quality. So, wow. um, this also has a, a world timer. So for, if, if, you know, for me, per, it works perfectly cause I set it on Sydney. Um, so I can know what time I mean, I, st- I get to know it anyway, but if I need to check, I just click the button and it will go straight to Sydney time. I can check and then click it and it'll go straight back to LA time. Um, awesome. it's also, if I, you know, because I travel a lot for work, if I get yeah. off off the plane, as soon as it syncs with my phone again, it, it moves on to that time zone. Um, so it's, it's a fun watch, but it also, the thing that I've loved the most about it was the reporting data from my sleep, the sleep application. Yeah. I always thought I was a terrible sleeper. Um, well, I didn't always think I was. I was. And yeah. then, and then um, you know, because my brain's ticking over too much or whatever, but I... I, I was, it was always really tough for me to get to sleep and then always really tough to wake up. And when I, I was testing this watch, I started seeing some patterns in my sleep that I was only getting about 45 minutes deep sleep per night. Wow. And the rest was spent, like I was in bed for eight hours, but the rest was spent in between times of being awake and light sleep. So I talked to my wife and we thought that can't be good for me long term. You know, mm-hmm. like, um, and then I went and got some tests done with a, a company called Everlywell. They sent me these home hormone testing kits. So I tested my cortisol levels and my um, melatonin. And what I found was incredible. It answered so much that my, um, my melatonin levels would, that are supposed to peak at night to help me sleep was dropping to zero, dropping to wow. nothing, nothing at night. And it was peaking at 10 o'clock in the morning, which explained why I'd need a dozen coffees to try mm-hmm. to get to my first meeting and I'm exhausted. You know? <laughs> so um, it was just my whole, my, my, all my melatonin was way out of whack and my life was upside down. Um, yeah, for sure. In, in my sleep. So I took some melatonin for six weeks or so and, mm-hmm. and was able to change some habits and, and get things under control. And now for the first time in probably 20 years maybe, um, I fall asleep at a normal time when I get into bed and I'm waking up with energy. So wow, um, that's not something. Usually, when I test the watches, it's I'm testing it, get to know the watch, and then I make recommendations of how to make it better. But this watch, what I wasn't expecting, was going to make a recommendation how to make me better. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, it's funny how much we have in common because uh, I have some sleep issues as well. I thought you, uh, I thought that I wasn't getting very good sleep either. So I went and did a sleep study. And come to find out, I was actually getting really deep sleep like that. Like, you know, it it normally takes somebody uh, 120 minutes to get into REM sleep. I go into it like that. Wow. So what that is, is narcolepsy. Yeah. So I actually have narcolepsy. But what's weird, and this is so strange, and... You know, it, it's funny because I can think back on it now and realize, oh, that's what that was. But, you know, there's actually times where I'm in between dream world and <laughs> being lucid. So, like, I'll, I'll be, like, watching TV and then I'll start to fall asleep and I get into REM while I'm still awake and it's the strangest feeling because you're already starting to dream, but everything is interacting with what's going on around in, you in, in real life while you're awake. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. So it's so strange. Um, I'm still, you know, kind of going through the doctor and, and figuring everything out. But yeah, that was one of the, one of the things for me was, was just, 
trying to get some sleep, I, I would sleep 45 minutes a night and think, oh man, this just isn't enough. But 45 minutes of REM sleep is more than most people get. <laughs> you mm. know what I mean? Yeah. No, it's all all about that work in progress, you know, constant work in progress and trying mm -hmm. to find ways to be better, be calmer, you know, feel more content and or, or more focused and, and have more drive, you know, whatever we need. Mm -hmm. It's all just a little bit better each time in every every area. And, and that's all it takes is a little bit, you know, we just got to improve a little bit. Pro forward motion, forward progress is the only way to go. Yep. So – What's next for Bo uh, Bozell? Um, what's, what's next for Bozell is um, we will continue to – I mean, we're talking to some of the biggest retailers here in the U.S. at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, we're starting to the, – the brand is, is changing a lot. We've got to we've – we've actually just become the um, official watch of the Australian Air Force 100-year anniversary next year. Wow, that's very cool. Yeah, so there's some exciting things happening. Christo is in his element designing an amazing watch um, that, if I'm not mistaken, will have a part of a of an old war plane, like one of the old Air Force planes. I'm sure it yeah, has. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, um, look, they're, they're super excited and, and happy with the, where the design's going. Um, we're, we're super excited to be chosen over some of the bigger brands. Um, yeah. And... You know, we're, we're, we're definitely, we're having different conversations as the brand and a stronger brand voice. And it, it's better representing the Australian lifestyle that we all live in Australia. You know, we love kangaroos and we love Red Earth and all of those things, but it's not how we live. We don't take them for granted. They're amazing. Yeah. But how we live, Australia has, you know, great food, great fashion, you know, Good looking people, if I'm allowed to say that. Other absolutely, than me. Um, absolutely. Uh, and doing, doing good things and striving for success. Um, you know, and we take life seriously, but not ourselves. So that's mm -hmm. kind of one of the things that, that we've, since we've rebranded, I guess, we're starting to have different conversations where more people can, can know that, yes, I, I associate with that brand and I aspire to, to live that lifestyle. Um, yeah. So. That's, you know, we, we're, we're talking, as I you know, just said, we're talking with some of the, the biggest retailers in the U.S. Um, so I don't think we'll know ourselves in the next six months to a year. <laughs> we're about to launch. That's a good thing. Yeah, it's great. So on, on top of that, we've got a, a couple of other bespoke things happening, but the, the Australian Air Force is super exciting. We've got, for the first time, our, we're about to, well, we, we've just received the prototypes or we're about to receive the prototypes of our new ocean moon, which is the fourth iteration of the ocean moon. Fourth, yeah. It's always been our bestseller. And um, one of the questions that people asked was always asked, you know, why is it a quartz? Why is it a quartz, not an automatic? Uh, well, guess what? Now it's an automatic. Wow. Um, yeah, for a, an amazing price point too. And um, with also with full dive capabilities, which we've never had before. Oh, so really? It, yeah, it's a, it's a double upgrade. Awesome. Oh, I can't wait to see that. And what about any of your other lines, like the Pro Pilot? Is there going to be any more of these Look, coming out, the, or the, the Pilot? We will, uh, I think, we'll phase out. Um, it just, I mean, it's it sells well, and it's a beautiful watch, and it's it's Christo's most passionate watch. He's most passionate about. Um, because, I love it because, yeah, I mean, it's watch people do. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's and it, it's the it's a fun watch, but like. Christo, when he used to ride his Vespa in the early days of Australia mm. across the, the Sydney, mm. oh, sorry, across the Sydney Harbour Bridge, he would look up and see the crosses um, yeah. of, of the framework, and that's how he designed that. And it's got the on the minute hand, it has the on the second hand, it has the the top of this center point tower, which is the highest tower in Sydney. Yeah. Um, so for him, that's his most passionate watch. But look, we we had to be or make some strategic decisions about the brand. Um, to build the brand and business decisions to grow it and having different, so many different types of watches that didn't have a boss L feel or mm -hmm. didn't, didn't represent better represent the brand for retailers, but also for customers when they're looking, looking at the brand, they see one thing and then they look at eight different watches on eight different price points. It becomes confusing. Yeah. Gotcha. So it's, it's, it's only, I love that watch too, but it's only for a business perspective that we will, 
or from a brand perspective that we want people to know who we are and you know we might we will still christo will still design some amazing stuff um yeah, of course but it will be more of our lifestyle australian lifestyle and it will be more ocean moon more vintage um i mean we've got some some great stuff happening we'll have some iterations of the uh of the air force watch um there's some Stay tuned. Yeah, that's, that's coming. <laughs> like it's gonna have that that brand language. Like you want to yeah. have everything be the same language. Otherwise, you're reading a book. There, one page is English, the other is German. Yeah, you know, you don't really want that. So I I, I get it. Um, it is a watch I love. I hate to see it go, but anybody out there, it, you're, you're hearing it now. It's going to be phased out, so you better yeah, do on, it while you can. <laughs> it, it, it's actually on our website as as make an offer, you know. So really, um, yeah. Well, I mean, it's certainly something we're trying for a limited time. Don't get <laughs> don't get too excited and think it'll be there forever. But um, I got some I got some <laughs> silver I can send over. <laughs> yeah, unless that's real silver, it's going to do be a little bit more, a little bit, a little bit higher offer than that. Yeah, it's it's real. It's real. <laughs> really, well, well, let's talk. Um, no, so look, it's 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 that is it for us. That was that's one of our found, I guess, founding watches that we base that we base a lot of Bossel on. Um, yeah. But as as Bossel's growing up. Um, you know, we need to we need to make sure that people understand who we are and we, we speak the right language through everything we do. Now, how do you feel about, you know, there's there's obviously y'all have plenty of brand presence. Um, stand alone, y'all do amazing. What do you feel about and this is something that we kind of talked about before? Um having like a micro and independent almost like a swatch group where uh, a lot of us brands kind of get together and work under one umbrella um look i think i think it works um uh, you know depending on getting the model right uh, you know if, if the model right it looks sorry if the model is right and it makes financial sense and it helps everyone grow like a you know almost like a co-op um exactly help each other one team one dream as chris mm -hmm. and i always say yeah um, and let's all grow and win together you know for us there's no no tall puppy syndrome where we want to cut down the people who are succeeding we want to see everyone succeed and and you know pull each other up along the way and that's kind of what made me think of of doing something like that is because there are some woes in the industry that that make it hard for especially younger brands um but for the most part everyone is very well received like i haven't run into a lot of uh competition you know what i mean like sure we're all kind of competing for our share of the market but for the most part like other brands have helped me out tremendously i've helped other brands out tremendously and that's just the, the camaraderie that comes in the micro and independent brand sp space you know it's a lot different than many other um industries that you're that you kind of get into mm. Look, it, there's. Have you ever read a book? It's a it's a business book called The Go Giver. I haven't. No. I'll I'll send you a copy. It's it's something that I read that I really connected with that I believe in. You know, everyone says, "Oh, he's a real go getter. He should get out and get that, and you know, watch him go and get." But getting, yeah. getting is all about taking. You know, yeah. so you're always looking for the next client, the next, you know, the next supplier, the next something because you're always on the take. But the Go Giver is about giving and building relationships that mm -hmm. last. You know, and and I help everyone because it's the, the more I help, the more friends I have, the more strong relationships, the more people are going to come and help me. That it, it's just it's like why not let's build this world together and and move each other mm -hmm. forward and and hey, I don't understand something here. This is your area of expertise. Can I give you a call? Mate, I just need to pick your brain. Yeah, and, yeah, uh, absolutely. That's the exact same outlook that I have on everything. You know. Networking, networking, networking is, is, you know, one of the hugest things and not just microbrand business, but all business period, you know, you have to have a huge network. Otherwise, you know, you For can't sure. stand out here alone, 
you yeah. know, you'll be out here alone and, and you won't last. There's sharks out here, <laughs> you know. For, for sure. But with the, with the like, the, the giving and helping, you can't be giving and helping just hoping to get something back. Because yeah, of course. Then it's, not, then it's not real and it's not authentic, you know. Mm -hmm. And authenticity is the key because you know, people are smarter these days, especially with social media. You send out an ad or you do a post or something that's not authentic, unfollow that or you just get trashed. But yeah. in, in this thing that I think that we're talking about of, of helping each other, if, you know, I like to add more value than I take in, in price, always give more than I take because, yeah. then, you know, and don't expect anything back, just help. Mm -hmm. And I know it, people, look, people will hear that and go, oh, yeah, just help. Like you're going to go broke or, you know, where's that going to get you? But let me tell you, it gets you, it gets you contentment. It gets you, uh, you feel good for actually helping trust. you do something nice. It gets you trust. It gets you so many things that help build a solid team of, of good people around you. Yeah, and that's just it because there's so many people that I can call on just because of that, exactly what you're talking about now. Yeah. You know, it, it, and it doesn't matter what time of day it is. It doesn't matter what time of night, you know, if, if there's an issue that I'm having that, that I can't fix on my own. Hey, so and so, uh, just like you said, this is your area of expertise. Help me out. Let me pick your. What brain. do you think about this? Yeah, yep. and and you know, I'm sure there'll be something that you know that that person doesn't, or you know, maybe not. Or hey, I know someone who can do that. Let me introduce you. Like, why not help each other? Yeah, it, absolutely. It, There's no sense in being one of those like. Scrooges that that clam up and they're not they're they don't want to share any secrets or you know they want to take secrets to the grave. But I did a an interview with Olivier More, and he said one of the coolest things that I ever heard. He said, "If you're sharing, say." You come to the table with a $20 bill and I come to the table with a $20 bill. If you give me your 20 and I walk away with 40, that leaves you nothing. If shoot, now I forget how it kind of went, but anyway, we, if we share together, we both have 40, yeah. you know, and, and that was basically the gist so of good. it. <laughs> yeah. So that was basically the gist of it is that, you know, if you walk away with 20, I walk away with 20. We're doing ourselves a disjustice because, you know, if you use it in terms of knowledge, you know, then we both walk away with a lot more wealth. Absolutely. And if there are 50 of us combining our, you know, our life knowledge in whatever industry, I mean, we have, a, we have our own library there. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> All right, so we talked about uh, uh, Bozell, where the future's going. I can kind of see uh, Christo in like the leather jacket and the glasses and getting ready to do the Air Force watch. <laughs> <laughs> but um, look, we're, we're we're also, you know, we we started last year in one of the, the people from the equity crowdfunding came to us and said, one of the, the investors and said, hey, would you mind if I, I do really well with a few of my businesses in France? Would you mind if we sent, so if I started running some digital ads for Bussell and see if I can create a market there? And we weren't selling in France, but Christo is, is French. And mm -hmm. we thought, sure, why not? Um, and so he started running a few digital ad campaigns in French speaking, like French speaking ads. And... France quickly grew in the last 12 months to be close to 30% of our total sales. Wow. And yeah. So that then made us realize, hey, we have enough brand equity to introduce ourselves or to break into new markets. So we have then, you know, we're, we, our strategy conversations changed and we're now kind of looking at other areas that we can break into and we're you know we're starting to do some good things in the US as I said so with add to that the the Air Force watch add to that the ocean ocean moon 4 automatic um, and some of the other stuff that Christo has in the pipeline and we're excited I, I'm jumping out of my skin I'm, you know, <laughs> I can't wait to get into each day and and see what you know open my emails and see which new opportunities coming because you know people are starting to come to us now 
um, because we're, you know, we're, we're making enough noise. Yeah. If there's anything that I can do to help uh, over here in the U S I've already mentioned to a few people, a few uh, online retailers that uh, are going to hopefully check you guys out. But now the one thing I wanted to ask, and I already know this story, but the listeners probably don't and the watchers probably don't, but how does, uh, um, um, not small micro brand, but you know, y'all are a decent sized uh, independent brand. How does an independent brand get a uh, Dominic Purcell to uh, be their ambassador? Do you want the full story or like the short story or like? Let's you know, hear the story. Let's. You know, it, we, we have still a, got, we still got a little bit of time. You know, Purcell <laughs> has a secret weapon, um, and that's my that's my wife. Um, <laughs> she used to be an actor's agent. So her, when she was starting out as, a, as an actor's agent in her early 20s, um, a few names that you might have heard of were just leaving acting school and at, at NIDA in Australia, which is National Institute of, Dr- of Dramatic Art, where it's, it's the epitome of, of acting in Australia. So yeah. when the people that were leaving school or leaving that, their dr- dramatic education at that time were people like, Hugh Jackman, Naomi Watts, Nicole Kidman, Simon Baker, um, like massive names. And Beck was their agent or most of their agent back in like in their early 20s. And then they all ended up over here in the US. So um, together. And when you are, you know, you're, you're overseas, you're away from your family. So you kind of become each other's family. Yeah. So with that network, um, you know, it grows and everyone works on shows together and movies and things. And, and so her network is quite different to most people's and it's way different to my network has ever been, you know. So, <laughs> um, I, yeah, I, I don't even know what to say on that one. Um, <laughs> coming from Maroomba Beach in Sydney to living in LA, is a, it's just a different world. Big different um, world. Yeah, yeah, big different world. And so Beck is good at knowing what, the structure, um, I guess, what she, she knows the needs of the brand. She knows the needs of the agent. She also knows the needs of the actor or the celebrity, the talent. So she can make things fit because she's been on all three sides. Mm-hmm. So she, I guess, put that deal together. And, and he's also Australian. Um, and, you know, he, we gave him some equity because he wanted to, you know, he loves an Australian brand and, and wanted to promote it because we couldn't afford him. We had to cut a small equity deal because we, we just don't have that money. Yeah, exactly. That's what I was wondering. It's like, you know, it's kind of hard to believe that, that someone so big could, that y'all could attain that, you know what I mean? Well, because, he's a, because he's Australian and, and, you know, and if you... There's a lot uh, of pride. Yeah, and I guess it comes back to authenticity. Mm-hmm. So... Um, with the, the whole authentic thing and, and being an Australian brand and Dominic Purcell being Australian too um, and, you know, and take it back even further, authenticity, how Dominic first got into acting, he was a landscape gardener out at like Western Sydney when he was like 18 or 19 and he right. hated it. He hated mm-hmm. it. And he was walking through the city one time and he, he saw a guy at the, at the opera house um, was like moving all the, the, the props in, like a stagehand out of a truck. And, yeah. he said, and he just must have been in a weird mood. And he said, hey, you know, have you got any jobs? You think I can't go back to that landscape gardening? And the guy goes, sure, blah, blah. And they talked and then he ended up getting a job as doing props at the opera house and nice. like as a stagehand. And then he started watching the actors and things and then he said, this is what I want to do. And then um, he became an actor. And then so having that full circle with the Opera House watch, um, How for him, cool it's, is that? It's just, yeah, it's just a, an amazing story. Um, wow. So he's been, he's been incredible for us. Um, he just helped us shoot uh, uh, an ad for the Vintage 2.0. I'm not sure if you've seen that, seen yeah. that, that video or not. Um, we did that up in, in uh, Vancouver, and he, he got one of the DPs or the director of photography from mm-hmm. one of the shows that he's on and, and, and got everyone from his team. He wanted to do that to promote this watch globally for Australia and for the brand, like for free. Yeah, I remember uh, you and I were talking about something and um, 
you were a little you were telling me that you were busy because you were y'all were shooting that commercial and yeah. then i i seen it like two or three weeks later i was like oh okay so this is what he's been up to <laughs> yeah, yeah. Look, it was it was a, a a different experience for me because we had dominic we had the director of photography we had a second photo camera guy we had the sound guy we had all these things what we didn't have which we kind of scrimped on because we had to pay for this one was a a director <laughs> um so i put my hand up and, and i had no idea what i was doing yeah <laughs> a couple of times a couple of times just put on a director's hat yeah. and a couple of times, i mean because look dom and i get on really well and you know he's don't worry about it you just get in and tell us what you want and whatever and like i kind of needed his expertise to help me tell me how to do it yeah um, absolutely and it was kind of a joke and you know you talk about that anxiety that you had before I'm sitting there thinking, here's a room full of absolute elite professionals <laughs> listening to this idiot who knows nothing <laughs> and think, like, what are you doing here? I was having panic attacks or whatever. And then, like, I'm sure. Tom could tell. He was laughing at me. He goes, look, you can't mess this up. It's not live. It's not live. We can take oh. it over and over again. So just chill. We're good, you know. <laughs> and then he, you know, he ended up saying, look, let's just have a couple of beers and we'll relax and we'll get the shot and whatever. But one thing I, I learned, from that, I mean, I work hard and I, I think that I'm always working, but I never feel like I'm working. Mm -hmm. Through the duration of that shoot, I felt like I worked every single minute of it. Those really? Guys, those guys work super, super hard. They're that goes to show you that you're in the right field because, you know, that old saying, you know, you do what you love, you never work a day in your life. Yeah. I, so and whenever you put on the director's hat and you – you have that feeling of what it's like to have a job, then you realize, okay, I, I'm, I'm definitely in the right field if, if I go to work every day and I don't have to feel this. <laughs> for sure, for sure. I mean, look, it's, for, for me, I, I guess how I got into business, it's a, a quick story, is I, I actually started out as a, as a hand-painted sign writer. So I was oh, wow. painting, painting signs on windows and storefronts and things like 20 five uh, more nearly 30 mm -hmm. something 30 something years ago and i used to go to work with a group of guys and they would all come in every day the older guys and say oh, i hate this job i hate that i hate whatever and i'd be saying like why don't why do you come mm -hmm. I, was, I was i was 18 or 19 and way too young to understand anything about alimony mortgages <laughs> you know bills whatever and but what i learned from that is i don't want to be those guys so yeah i, I ended up um, you know, the minute I finished my apprenticeship, I said, I'm going to work for myself. And they said, what are you going to do? I said, I don't know. They said, what do you know about business? I said, nothing. But <laughs> I know that I know a lot of people and I know I can get them to give me work. So I just left the next day. The minute I finished my apprenticeship, I knew I had my trade behind me and, and I just went out and made so many mistakes, so <laughs> many mistakes. And I, had a, I created for 10 years, I thought I had a business. I didn't have a business, I had a job. It was all yeah. totally, totally focused on me. And, you know, I had staff, but I was, I was running a childcare center more than a business. I was yeah. involved in everyone's problems and, you know, I couldn't manage people. It was just, it was hell. And then I went and studied business after about 10 years to realize that, you know, a lot of things I was doing right, but I just wasn't automated enough. So yeah. I needed to set systems in place and, and automate things. And that's why I got, I got really into the COO role. Like I love the operations and yeah. that's what I did in, in, the, um, in the previous company in the beauty industry where I set up the global logistics, make sure every, every part of the company is talking to itself and it's all automated and then the rest, you can just grow the business while all, every, all the mechanics work. So is that something that you prefer to do is this uh, like start up the business, be the entrepreneur during the startup phase and then – sell it off or do you like to hang on to it and see where the businesses go look it, it depends um i mean it depends on the potential of each business you know and and how big the market is how flooded it is i mean there's so many pros and cons that you have to weigh up i mean everything needs to yeah. do you need to do the due diligence on all of it needs a, each needs a full business case proposal um but for me i love the startup phase i love the yeah. i love the fast growth i love the energy um i love the lack of red tape and the quick, agile decision-making. Yes. 
I, I, I don't like, I mean, at some stage it needs to become corporate when you, if you are going to get the next level and shareholders involved. And then if you, you know, you bring in venture capitalist money and, and when it gets to the, the next level, then the one after that, eventually you need to be corporate. I mean, we've got 150 shareholders now that I answer to um, and I want to add value for those guys. Yeah, but of course. If you, I mean, and if you, you know, IPO, for, for instance, that comes with a whole, you know, other host of headaches. So, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it really, it really depends, but uh, I do love the, the initial startup phase because it's so creative and it's so, yeah. I mean, the, uh, always owning and well, being an entrepreneur for 25, 30 years, um, it's, it's, there's certain parts you love and certain parts you hate. But the part about the next stage is also exciting because it's, it's new growth, it's new learning, it's, it's seeing how that plumbing fits together yeah. in, in a new way to able to, to enable that next expansion. I love it because it's it it's problem solving at its best. You know, you're you're always looking for the next solution. It, it's you're always It is exactly <laughs> and just like you talked about I mean this much could change everything. Everything. Angles could change and everything. Where is our leverage in this situation and how can we change the angle to use that leverage to project us forward absolutely everything comes full circle man mm -hmm. that's actually a, a really good point to uh to kind of end on and uh i love it man uh we'll, we'll have to get together again and hopefully you know in person in one of these events if they open the world back up yeah. eventually <laughs> um well, one day one day that's but for either, sure either way we can talk shortly because we covered some topics that we we connect on so i think we need to talk on some of that anyway yeah absolutely 100 percent. we'll we'll be in touch and uh you know we got some work that we can do together as well as you know our our friendship stuff so you know i i'm i'm super super honored to have you on and uh i'm glad to spend an hour with you it's been fun it's been fun we covered some covered some stuff that's you know i'm passionate about and that means a lot to me especially the 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 watches the business or well, there's my three passions business other my family jujitsu and mental health and if i can make a difference in in any of those three areas my life's pretty good i mean absolutely my life, my life absolutely so thanks 100%. for having me on and um looking forward to the next time we talk all right me too man you be good and uh We'll see Buzel out there, and if there's anything that I can do to help, I'll I'll uh, I'll, I'll introduce you guys to uh, to whoever I can. <laughs> All right, well, man. Thanks, mate. You take it easy. You too.